Good morning, everybody. So, as you've heard, my name is Roman from ETH Zurich, and today I will present you some of the work I've been conducting in the frame of this um, IoT Bench consortium initiative. So, the, the main focus, as the name implies, of this initiative is to do benchmarking for IoT. So, when we are talking about benchmarking, what we mean is essentially doing comparison between the performance of different things, different systems. So we had the first workshop last year, and we were saying that, okay, we need to do benchmarking. And people came around and like, whoa, 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 kind of like, you're talking about doing benchmarking, and as we've heard already twice this morning, we're not even able to reproduce our own results. So maybe we should take it one step at a time and think first about repeatability, and then maybe we'll move on to benchmarking. So okay, so okay, what is repeatability, how can we do that? and realize that if we want to aim for repeatability, we need to clarify a bit the way we design and we perform uh, experiments. And this is what this talk is about. So why ma what makes it difficult for, for, uh, to achieve repeatable experiment in, in, low wi um, in wireless <coughs> systems? A few things. First thing that we know is that the radio frequency environment has tendency to affect the performance of our systems in ways that are essentially infeasible to predict. That's a fact that we have to live with. The second thing is that we know that a real RF environment, being indoors or outdoors, is something that we cannot really control. So both stacked together means that whatever we do, we will expect variability in the performance. That's how it is. We need to live with this and we need to find ways to do that. Right? And we'll hear a lot more about this kind of problems <coughs> later on today. So okay, we need to deal with variability. That's definitely not a uniqueness of local wireless, something that happens a lot in science, and we know how to tackle this. How do we do that? The typical answer is you repeat your experiment, right? You do the thing multiple times, and therefore you expect to temper the variability by having many, many results. Okay, fair enough. I want to repeat my experiments, and then quickly enough, you will face what I call the two kilo questions. How long should you run your experiment, and how many times you should do it? Well, as far as I know, there is today not really a good answer to those questions. But let's assume you run many, many tests for many long times, and you collect a lot of data points, and let's assume your data set is perfect, good, everything's great. Now, how do you synthesize your results? The typical approach is that you use some statistical methods. Right? Now, a statistic is literally a piece of data that you compute based on a larger set of data. Okay? And you can use various statistics, mean, median, to do this kind of thing. And now comes the really tricky thing that you should all be aware of. Make the difference between descriptive and predictive statistics, which are completely different things that allows you to do to make different claims. Descriptive statistics tell you what your data is like. The predictive statistics, on the other hand, tells you what the collected data allows you to infer or to predict about what could happen or what could have happened. <coughs> and this is what is the most interesting case for us. And I will try to, to explain you with a small example why is that. Let's say we take two samples of the same random variable x. So what I can do is I can use predictive statistics, and then I can say, for regardless of whatever metric, the sample A is better than the sample B. Okay? That's about it. I cannot say anything more than that if I just look at the sample. And that's descriptive statistics. Now, if I'm trying to do predictive statistics, on the other hand, from my samples, I try to infer the underlying distribution from which the samples are coming from. So typically, I will try to use some, some math to, from those samples, estimate this distribution, and then I compare not only the samples, but I compare the distributions. And I will eventually make claims such that distribution A is better than distribution B, and that means that if I were to sample those distributions anytime, then likely the sample A would be better than the sample B. And this is what we are interested in doing. This is the type of claims we are interested in making. However, even that is much stronger, it's also a much stronger, uh, much more difficult statement to make. 
So how can we do that? Um, let's say we have our set of set of samples and we're trying to make predictions. We can compute statistics such as the mean and the standard deviation in order to get information about the tendency and the variability of our data. And we remember, all of us vaguely from our early statistical uh, classes, that the mean and the standard deviation correlate to the shape of the underlying distribution, saying that roughly like 68% of our distribution lies between the mean plus minus. We all know that. We've all been told that at some point. But if we use that approach to do prediction, we're essentially making two very important problematic mistakes. The first mistake is that the standard deviation of the sample is not the same thing as the standard deviation of the underlying distribution. So if you're interested in making prediction, you need to be careful about what you're saying, and you need to use what is called confidence interval. To be very quick, what a confidence interval is, is a numerical interval between which the true value of some number, some parameters, for example, the standard deviation, lies with the given probability. So for example, if the interval AB is a 95% confidence interval for the mean of the given variable X, then that the true mean value of X lies between A and B with a probability of 95% or higher. This is a confidence interval. Now, first mistake, Sample is different from an underlying distribution. Second mistake, the distribution you're studying is not normal. 99% of the cases, maybe sometimes very few rare cases will be the case, but most likely, and we'll hear a lot of other examples today, it's not. So you should use statistics that do not depend on the properties of the underlying distribution. And the good news is, such methods do exist. And even better, so bottom line, don't do this. This is the wrong picture to have in mind for doing prediction based on the measurement data. So you should, you should use those non-parametric statistics uh, because typically the type of distribution we study are more not normally distributed. They look more like this with the bulk of the distribution and a very long tail on one side, on the other side, what it, depending on the type of, of things you're studying. And one recommended approach, if you look in the literature, is to use uh, statistics based on percentiles. And as all of you know, the percentile P of a distribution is defined as being the numerical value such that P percent of the distribution lies below this value, 1 minus P percent lies above. Right? Fair enough. And using this is very interesting to do predictive statistics for three reasons. The first is that they are actually extremely easy to use and much easier than mean and standard deviation, for example, which you should not use. Second is that they are distribution independent. That's what we started with. Those are non-parametric statistics. And third, they are extremely robust to outliers values that may happen in, in our chemical experiments. Let me show you why, why those statements hold. The first thing is that you can compute for any percentile you're interested in, any percentile P, the confidence interval for those percentiles. And you can see from this slide, regardless of the math, that this is a one-liner. It's actually pretty easy to compute. What's the intuition? Why, why is it that the math is so simple? Well, it's essentially based on how the percentiles are being defined. So let's take a look at the median for a second, the most well-known percentile, cut the distribution in half. Now, let's take the extreme case where I have only one sample. Okay, not very useful, but what we know is that this sample lies with 50% probability below the true value of the median and 50% probability above the value of the median. Because this is how the median is being defined. And be aware that here I'm talking about the median of the underlying distribution that X is coming from, my sample is coming from. Right? Now if I assume that I measure that again and I have uh, IID samples, then I take a second sample and the distribution, the probability multiplies. So the probability that the true median lies below those two values is one quarter, above the two values one quarter, in between two one half. And guess what? We can do that with three samples, and with four samples, and with five samples, and all as many as you want. And this is how the math gets so simple, because the mechanism works like that for any percentile, for any number of, of uh, for any percentile and any number of parameters. There's another side benefit here, which is that in this one-liner, there is this parameter m here. 
which tells us how many of our n samples we want to use to make our prediction. What does that mean? It means that if I take my, again, my eight sample uh, example, then I can do the math and compute that the, the probability of the true median to lie between the two extreme values is about 99%. Now, I don't have to use my eight measurements. I can use only the in, in, inner six. And if I do that, I exclude two of my points, then the probability that the median is between those points decreases. Sounds, sounds intuitive, right? But now, if I use that as an estimate, it means that it doesn't really matter where the external points are. The estimation I'm making, meaning the interval and the confidence, are independent of the values of my outliers. And this is what makes the robustness of the method. And I can say, OK, I have more outliers. I can keep decreasing the number of, num of uh, samples that I'm using. And I have a direct connection between the number of samples that I use for making my prediction and the confidence I have in this prediction, which is very nice. So, very easy to use, one-liner, distribution independent, and extremely robust to outliers. <coughs> and there's an additional side benefit to this, that here it says, I can compute for any percentile of any confidence. There's actually, going out of the math, again, a nice, simple uh, equation that relates the number of samples, the confidence, and the percentile value of interest, meaning that I can choose the confidence I am aiming for, I can plug in the percentile I want to study, and I take directly the number of measurements I need. And that is how we hope to address our cubic question from the beginning. How many measurements do you need? So now, by using this kind of framework, we have a scientific way, a rational way to answer those key questions. And this is the base of the foundation of the methodology for designing the experiment that, that I'm going to present now. Okay, so far so good. So we are aiming for predictions. That's the goal. We have a well-funded literature that will tell us how to do this. And now we try to apply this in our specific context of wildlife experiments. If we take a step back, what was our goal? Our goal was to com make comparisons. Right? That's what benchmarking is about. So I have, I, I have my test in which, my test configuration in which I run my experiment. I have the protocol I'm evaluating. I want to compute performance result and eventually I want to say, is that better than protocol B? But as I already argued, we cannot do that directly because we need repeatability. So we perform the experiment many times. Then we try to assess whether the things are repeatable so that eventually we can compare. But to do this, we need to clarify how we exactly run the experiments. Because if someone else is doing it and we're not exactly explaining what happened there, there's no chance to repeat our results. Now, if we look up in this box, we have a process which is essentially in three steps. We collect the raw data, we process this raw data, and then based on the process data, we compute some kind of performance results in the sentence step. You can call that uh, KPIs or performance indicators, whatever you like. And so in, to describe this whole three steps, we identify five key questions that need to be answered. The first is which metrics you want to compute. We had a, an example in, in the talk just before that it's not obvious a priori what are the right metrics for the type of question you're trying to answer. Which data should you collect from your experiment? Question two. Question three. First of our killer questions, how long should be the experiment? How do you synthesize the results? So what is your strategy to take this process data and to convert this into uh, KPI? And finally, second of our killer questions, based on our strategy, how many samples do we need? So to help us going through those, those steps, uh, let's take a very simple case study, a scenario that many of us know very well, simple data collection scenario. Simple, uh, like a multi-hop network, a bunch of source nodes that have a given number of payload to send to some sink somewhere, but some rate, doesn't really matter. Now, first question is which, which are the metrics that we want to compute? Now, I find useful to think about this question by distinguish the performance dimensions, the metric, and what I call the metrics. What those are? The performance dimensions are essentially reliability, latency, energy consumption, and so on. And the others, but those are the typical three ones we're interested in. Okay. 
Now, to investigate those metrics during these things, those dimensions, you have different metrics you can use, okay? But there is something else to this. For, say, reliability or energy consumption, you may be interested in either the average performance or the external performance, or maybe the variability of the performance. And those are important to know because this will detect the type of measures you want to use and compute on your measurements. For example, let's say that on my scenario, on my protocol, I'm interested in answering this kind of questions, which is how many application payload do you expect to receive if you execute the scenario? Now, this raises the average reliability, which I can investigate with the packet reception rate, and I could compute the mean because it relates to the average. Wrong. You don't compute the mean. Why? Argument of the first part. We're trying to make predictions here. So in order to make predictions, the mean will not help us. So better use something like the median instead. Just a reminder to see if you still remember the first part. Okay, so we use the median. Fair enough. Uh, and just, just to conclude, the importance is that we choose the metrics and the measure based on what we care about. Think about that first before you pick the metrics, otherwise you will collect data and compute things that actually you don't do anything with. Which data should you collect? Not much to, to say here. Uh, you should collect at least what you need to compute your metrics, duh. Uh, but if you can, give us a bit more data than what you need. So aim for more refined uh, raw data because all the people might be interested in your data that in ways that you're not aware of a priori, so it might be useful for them. Now you need to define how the length of your experiment, and that is really tricky. Because if you think about that carefully, you will realize that the right length will depend not only on the scenario, but also on the type of protocol you're studying. However, there is an easy case. The easy case is, is the scenario is terminating and short. And in this case, you should just run the whole scenario. And if you do that, and by the way, that's the case I chose for my example, right? So we, we are terminating, meaning that I have 200 payloads per source, and that's done, right? This is all I have to do. And it's short because I decide to bond it in time, arbitrarily, right? And if I do this, then I have only uncertainty in the, non in the repetition of the scenarios, right? when I repeat over time the, the experiment. So, let's say we are in the, in the easy case, we just run the scenario in full and forget about it. Now, I know how long I will run, the question is how do I compute my KPIs? And, well, if you follow the, the argument so far, you want to compute the KPIs based on the prediction you are able to make, and the prediction rely on the confidence interval, so that should be a part of the definition of your KPIs. For example, we can compute the packet reception rate per experiment, Right, that will give us uh, uh, samples xj. On those xj, I can compute the 95% confidence interval on the median, which will give me a range like this. And then if I want to reduce that down further to a unique numerical value, you can do that in many ways. One sensible approach, just an example, would be to take the conservative bound, meaning the pessimist of the two. If I get reception rate, the higher the better, so we take the lower bound, for example. Now, how many experiments should you run? Well, if you're interested in repeatability, you should aim for tight confidence interval. The more experiments you run, the more data you have, the hope is that you will narrow down the confidence interval. And the higher the percentile, the more experiments you need. So for example, in our case study, we are based on 95% confidence interval on the median. If you run the math, you will see that you need a minimum of six uh, samples, six tests. However, doing this means that, well, the confidence of the whole range, they have like one of liar, but my estimate will be very bad. So we decided to run in our example 20, 20 runs, which gives us a confidence interval which is bad shape, so I can omit, exclude from my estimate five outliers on each side. That's an arbitrary choice. So now that we have answered all our questions, you can run your experiments. You have your 20 data points, so 10 to uh, packet reception rate. We have here the 95% confidence interval on the median. And then you have your performance indicator that you explain how you want it to compute. Right? We take the pessimist bound. And the nice thing is that because we have 
strictly define how the methodology is, we have an unambiguous performance report. And we can do that for one protocol, we can do that for any mini, arbitrary mini protocol and arbitrary mini dimensions. Okay. So we are progressing on the way to help going towards repeatability. But we have been discussing about the methodology and the hoping we can make the statement that yes, the results are repeatable. But there are still a few things that are not quite there yet. Right? And you might have noticed that the first word in my talk is false totals. Because we're not completely done. Um, there are three major issues that I kind of omitted so far. The first is that the, we have the requirement that the measurements are IAD in order to be able to do any useful prediction. And that is definitely not a given for the type of protocol that we use, for the type of environment we're working with. And so that needs to be addressed. We cannot just make the assumption that our measurements are IAD and be done with. Second is, well, I use the terminating scenario example, but it's still not clear what do we do when the scenario is not terminating. I want to deploy a uh, data collection scenario network somewhere for running infinity. Then it's not so clear how long should I run my test. And finally, we still don't know what repeatability means. So we have the intuition that I want the results to be close, but I still haven't formalized it yet. And if I haven't, if I don't have a formalized definition, then I cannot make a strong claim that those results are repeatable. So the good news is that we are actually working on those questions and we have some initial ideas of how this could, those challenges could be answered. Uh, this is work in progress. I'm happy to discuss that further, but that's slightly beyond the topic of, the, of today's talk. And with this, uh, I would like to conclude. I hope I have convinced you that understanding the purpose of the statistics is extremely important. I hope you understood the message is not to tell you don't use mean and standard deviation, but if you do, don't make predictions based on that, because you're likely you're making big mistakes. So it's fine to use, but use it for the right purpose. And if you want to do predictions, don't use that. And I hope you get a feeling about like how we aim to go towards repeatability for the power of Thank you. <laughs>